Welcome to the Fusionary Health Podcast. Today, I have a very special guest for you, Dr. Eric Balkavaj, who's a chiropractor up in Pennsylvania. And I'm so excited to have you on the show. Welcome. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah. So I'm going to share a little bit about him before we get started. He's the clinical director of his practice, RejuvaGen. He's a doctor of chiropractic medicine, certified functional medicine practitioner, board certified in integrative medicine. He's a certified gluten coach, which we're going to talk about that because I'm very passionate about gluten and what it does to us. And he's been widely recognized around the world as a leader in functional medicine and thyroid physiology. And so today we're going to dive into this topic. He has a book out called The Thyroid Debacle. And I've seen for myself so many women struggle with thyroid health, not get the clarity they need, not get the answers they need. Um, and I'm really frustrated on that topic. So I'm excited to have you as my guest today. Welcome. Thank you. I'm happy to be here and let's talk thyroid. All right. So my first question is, why is it that so many women, I think it's post childbirth, I'm sure it's like pre childbirth, but why is it that there's this prevalence of thyroid conditions? And why is it then when I have most of my friends and women go to endocrinology, their answer is, all right, we've looked at your blood work, you're almost there. And when you're there, we'll prescribe you a drug that you'll be on for the rest of your life and we'll increase that drug over time. Um, but you're not there yet. So just hang tight until you're sick enough that we put you on a medicine. And when I ask the question, which is, can they do anything in their diet or lifestyle that'll prevent this? The answer is no, which always enrages me because I'm like, that's categorically factually untrue. Mm -hmm. So can you share with us just that big picture of, of why is this such a big problem? So yes, first, the first issue, why is thyroid issues such a big problem? I think it's twofold. Um, for those who aren't aware, there's two primary causes of, of glandular hypothyroidism, which means that the gland's not making enough thyroid hormone. Uh, one of those is iodine deficiency, which essentially nobody really evaluates for today. Uh, the other is thyroiditis, which is an immune-driven damage to the gland, which in allopathic medicine, many times they don't test for because they assume that that's the primary cause. And it's generally considered that it's an it's idiopathic, meaning we don't know why it occurs. We think there's genetic predispositions, lifestyle factors that play can play into it. Um, but ge generally, because we don't have a set thing that this always causes thyroiditis and the system, the allopathic system isn't really set up to address the why in each individual, um, they just say, hey, it's going to your gland's probably going to kick out at some point and we want to provide thyroid medication. Um, but de definitely what's the big driver is typically, an ex in my opinion, excessive load of stress on someone's physiology. And it's not a thing, as we often say in functional medicine, what's the root cause? The root cause is lots of causes. It's an excessive load over time. So physical stress, chemical stress, emotional stress, trauma, nutritional stress, alcohol, toxins. And that sounds like, holy cow, it could be everything. Yeah, it probably is. The accumulation of lots of stress and an inability to adapt to that stress shifts a person from what we call homeostatic regulation, low stress physiology to something called allostatic regulation, which is excessive stress physiology. And when that occurs, the body is, assumes that it's under threat, under danger, and starts increasing inflammatory processes and down-regulating thyroid physiology and even up-regulating the immune response at the thyroid gland to create compromise. And so those are the, those are the big to two big issues. Uh, allopathic medicine knows that, that, that the primary cause is likely thyroiditis, but they're not checking typically for iodine deficiency. So they just make the assumption that that's the case. The challenge, and I think this is the, the second piece of what you were asking is, if somebody has signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism, and we can see that it looks like a thyroid condition. It looks like the gland's not making enough thyroid hormone. Why is it that they don't intervene sooner if 
why, you know, why wouldn't they just intervene right away? A person's got signs and symptoms of it. They look like they may be hypothyroid. They're telling you the symptoms, the le- but why aren't they not intervening soon enough? And that's because of how they're taught and what the guidelines are. The guidelines say that people shouldn't be prescribed thyroid hormone too early. And the functional and integrative community has a problem with that. We, I think we take a look at it differently but the medical community has been trained to say, hey, we're not going to give thyroid hormone until the gland has lost 90% of function or more, and then we're going to replace thyroid hormone. And I think this is going to sound controversial, but I think they're correct. I think in functional medicine, we intervene way too early and in order to try and optimize physiology. Sure. And so we in functional medicine and integrative medicine say we're go- are the person's symptomatic. I want to give them help. I want to give them support. And I think what a lot of functional medicine and integrative practitioners don't realize is that that may actually be more problematic than they're considering. So if mm-hmm. the uh, some if your assumption and this is where you and I may differ, but if your assumption yeah. is that the immune system is attacking the immune system's out of control and it's just creating damage to the gland mm-hmm. and that there's no cell stress going on at the in the phys- at the cellular level and that the cells are in homeostasis and they just need hormone then sure yeah. then you just provide more thyroid hormone but if you're providing if you believe as i do that thyroid down regulation is an adaptive response to cell stress which is you can find uh, enough studies. That's what the whole book is about is the research that backs that up. If down regulation of thyroid physiology is an adaptive response to excessive cell stress, that's what the body's trying to do. It's trying to slow down normal metabolism and ramp up cell defense, even though adding some thyroid hormone may make somebody feel better initially. If you're working against the innate intelligence of the body, why is that beneficial to the patient? It's not. So that's my argument. So why are we providing thyroid medication too early? And what you'll hear in our community is because I want to optimize their T4 and I want to optimize their T3, assuming that the innate intelligence of the body isn't doing what it needs to do anyway. Now, that doesn't mean nobody needs thyroid medication. It doesn't mean nobody can, sure. won't feel better with some medication. But um, is it appropriate to address the root cause issues and to appropriately support somebody's physiology? And I would make the argument that it's not in many people. So interesting. This is like you're, you're making my brain explode because it's so counter to everything that I've seen in terms of how functional medicine is approaching thyroid and my own experience. I was prescribed um, a very low dose of a more natural form of thyroid medication 10 years ago, I think. And it was awesome. Like it literally when someone, when my first functional medicine doctor prescribed armor thyroid, which is also known as NP thyroid, it's pig thyroid hormone. And you can probably explain better the, the makeup of it. I felt like someone put glasses on in my brain. Mm -hmm. I could literally physically see better. I could think better. I was post kids. I post my first child, couldn't think straight, couldn't function, had no memory, felt like the biggest idiot on the planet. I was having to keep post-it notes because if anyone said anything to me and I didn't write it down, I'd forget. Um, My energy, my mood, everything shifted. So because it's it's like you, you gave me a magic pill almost, I could function like my old self. But what's so interesting about what you're saying is you're saying, listen, there was probably some work that needed to be done. The body was doing that on purpose. Mm -hmm. And your innate need, you use the word innate intelligence, the innate intelligence of the body was saying, hey, we've got, we need some help here. They weren't saying, please take a pill, mask the problem. You feel great. You're still going to go at 200 miles an hour. You're leaving the body behind. And that intelligence is saying, uh, gut healing, uh, detoxing, I need some support. So how do you look at medications like that? Um, and do you ever, like sometimes my philosophy is give the patient the support, get them the help. 
but then push them to do the lifestyle and they now are supported to go exercise, eat cleaner. They have the energy to do the work. So how do you approach that? Well, and I, I get it. That's the general philosophy in functional and integrated medicine in the optimizer community. They're saying, okay, this person can't, the body doesn't know how to convert T4 to T3 anymore. Um, they're assuming the body's broken and I don't assume that. And so if you assume that the body's broken, I could understand why, Hey, if the body can't convert T4 to T3, then I should give T3. Um, and per somebody could feel better initially, but what you typically see is I got five micrograms of T3 and I felt good for a while, but then it didn't last. And then I needed a little bit more and I took a little bit more and the lights came back on again. And then I, plateaued out. And if you start doing this manipulation of the blood labs, then you're, you're not going to get a thyroid gland to recover. Because how is a thyroid gland get going to recover if you're constantly suppressing the need for the thyroid gland to function? So for me, when people come to see me, I, I want to know what the, what, what's their outcome that they want. And most of the people want a couple things. They want their symptoms to improve, of course. They want to lose weight. They want to do all those things. But ultimately, a lot of people are like, I don't want to have to take thyroid medication for the rest of my life if I don't have to. And sure. some people have been told that once you're on thyroid medication, once you have an issue, you're going to need thyroid medication forever. And I think that is right. true for people who are medicated, especially if they're over medicated. That is the, going to be the strategy. And if you're okay with that and you take T4 and T3 and you optimize your blood levels and you like taking T3 and T4 every day and you feel awesome, I don't care. But if you've done, if you're not feeling fantastic, but you're, you're trying to, you've tried the optimization model, then what are you trying to accomplish? Do you just want your blood levels to be optimal or do you want to try and find what's driving this reduced production of the thyroid gland, what's causing the reduced conversion of T4 to T3, get your body to convert better so you don't need the T extra T3 and two, get your thyroid gland to start to kick into gear uh, and start to recover. And it can, the thyroid gland can recover. I've got plenty of patients. I do thyroid Thursday lab this, reviews all the time um, where that occurs, but you have to do a couple things. You have to make sure you identify root cause issues, the stressors that are creating, accumulating or causing that excessive cell stress response. You can't have a patient over medicated on, on thyroid replacement therapy, and you can't be worried like about a TSH level being outside of somebody's predetermined optimal range of one to two if you want your thyroid gland to recover because there's no need for a thyroid gland to make thyroid hormone if you're over medicating and suppressing TSH. TSH has to go up to turn the sodium iodide symporter back on to siphon iodine back into the thyroid gland and turn that system back on. So let's take a step back then. You started with iodine and then you mentioned thyroiditis, which to me, itis means inflammation. Mm -hmm. And then you said it's idiopathic and they just don't know where it's coming from. Well, if something is an itis and the source is inflammation, don't we know that the need to address inflammation is there? And then when you said iodine and no one's testing us for it, how can we go after these stressors, as you're calling it? My assumption of the stressors is, and, and how I think of it for myself is plastics. Uh, what's your water bottle? How are you storing your food? How are you cooking your food? Self-care, you know, what's your skincare? Like, what are all the environmental factors that are going to touch your body or that you're going to breathe in that will affect you? And then on top of that, we go into environmental stressors. Is there mold? Is there heavy metal? Is there exposure that could be driving these autoimmune issues or the body's reactiveness, um, reactivity? And then finally, stress. Like, are we too stressed out? And thus we're causing this. So how do you look at that? Well, I think the first part I, t I was discussing the two primary causes of hypothyroidism. So you have to assess both of those. And it's a possibility that you have both an iodine deficiency right. and thyroiditis going on at the same time due to some excessive cell stress response driven by the things you talked about. The problem is, is that if you're overloading on medication or you're trying to optimize your blood levels, you're going to 
uh, potentially create a more inflammatory condition and upregulation of the sympathetic nervous system and potentially hide an iodine deficiency. Replacing thyroid hormone for what the gland isn't, can't make does not fix an iodine deficiency. But if you're over medicating, you may not see an iodine deficiency pattern. So as a clinician, as a functional medicine practitioner, we have to do both. We can't just assume everybody is in just iodine deficient. We can't just assume that everybody's got thyroiditis. And we can't assume that they only have one of these things or the other. In most cases, a lot of people, especially those who are on an AIP-ish style diet, they exercise and sweat on a regular basis. They're avoiding iodine at all costs. And um, they're not eating... A, a, other iodine rich, they're not eating seafood because they're worried about toxicity. And so the good chance is that the healthiest, the people that are most motivated to try and recover their thyroid physiology are going to be the pe people who are most likely to be iodine deficient when we're looking at, when we actually start looking at their levels. That's a profound statement. And I think about that a lot sometimes because I'm um, in the health and wellness space. I own a supplement company. I teach about health. And sometimes that's the worst person to be because you know too much, you study too much, you read too much, you go to all the conferences. When we all go to our big functional medicine conferences, what are we doing? We're teaching each other about what's the worst thing and what's the best thing. And then what you're actually doing is pushing so many things out of your life that you're you're really living in a very narrow space. Like I, for myself, and I look at my blood work and I, I'm just like, why do I have so many deficiencies? And I'm like, well, look at your diet. Look at how limited you've made it. Um, and so do you do testing on iodine? Is it like an at-home test? How can people understand that piece? So there's lots of discussion about iodine testing. There's a discussion that iodine testing is not valid because iodine is variable. You've got the Brownstein model where um, they do 50 milligrams of iodine loaded into the system, then collect a 24-hour urine. Um, I don't, I'm not a huge fan of overloading somebody who I've just really know know who they are remember i you know i grew up in the detis karazi and training model where like if somebody's got thyroiditis we're not you know we're we're we're, we're afraid of iodine because that might increase tpo activity and that might cause more thyroiditis i don't think that's the case um i used to believe that 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 the antibodies were like little pac-man eating away the thyroid gland i don't believe that that's the case today but um, there are tests. I, how I do it is typically look, I'll look at a blood iodine and I'll utilize, there's a lab that does toxic and essential elements. I'll look at those two things together so I can see what's in the blood, what's coming out of the urine, the cofactors, and um, the things that might interfere with it. But I, I also look at labs and try to time when I'm interpreting labs, is it the first thing I do? No, because that pattern not be, may not be present because the person's over medicated. And if they have multiple malabsorption issues going on, micro, multiple micronutrient deficiencies going on, I don't want to necessarily just test them for iodine and load them with iodine. They already got a malabsorption issue. We need to support what's going on with the gut. So many times what happens is some people show up and you can see the pattern. It's easy to see the iodine deficiency pattern, but a lot of people over medicated, you can't see the pattern. You might have an assumption, but it's, you start working on those diet and those lifestyle things. And then as you start to work on those and you see better conversion of T4 to T3, then an I, a true iodine deficiency pattern will start to pop from their labs. And then you go, okay, here's what we got to check and do next. So interesting because you mentioned gut. And so always, if someone asked me recently, you know, my hormones are imbalanced. I just need a hormone test. And I said, well, have you done a stool test? Have you actually looked at your gut? Because gut and hormones are connected. So can you explain that connection for our listeners today? How, how the gut and the hormones are connected? Yeah. Well, I mean, everything has to go into the GI tract and pretty much everything is coming out through the GI tract. So we have to have healthy gut function, gut physiology. And so if you've got dysbiosis in the GI tract, if you've got intestinal permeability, um, you're likely going to have a 
in, uh, increased upregulation of the inflammatory processes, increased inflammation is going to adaptively trigger um, what we more cell danger physiology. So inflammation results in signaling mechanisms to go on where it's like, hey, there's a threat. We need to slow down metabolism. We need to ramp up these defense mechanisms. So that's going to have a, an impact on thyroid physiology. We may see a reduced conversion of T4 to T3 and up upregulation of the level of reverse T3 in somebody. We may see suppression of TSH initially as the inflammatory mechanisms go up because we start to get increased conversion of T4 to T3 at the hypothalamus, which then drives more sympathetic dominance, downregulates the gut further, unfortunately. And right. then we might see, because there's an actual, they've documented direct lymph connection from the gut to the thyroid gland. So if I have inflammatory mechanisms going on and these damage associated particles, we call damps and pamps in circulation, getting into the bloodstream, getting into the lymph, those damps and pamps don't only signal the immune inflammatory response, but they can also bind to pattern recognition receptors on the thyroid cells themselves and initiate thyroiditis. It's not the infiltrating immune cells that are actually creating a lot of the initial thyroiditis, but it's these danger particles that bind to these recognition receptors that actually turn thyroid cells into immune-like cells and create their own self-destruction. And then those cells that are damaged release inflammatory signaling molecules out into the bloodstream that then attracts more T cells and more lymphocytes into the tissue to cause more challenge and destruction. So if you've got problems in there, it's going to affect everything. And this is what I talk about in my book. I call it a multi-system adaptive response. It's We don't have separate systems. That's a reductionist view of physiology to make it easy to learn. But that is not how physiology works. So if I've got a cell stress response that's caused by problems going on in my gut, I should expect thyroid hormone downregulation. I should expect glucose dysregulation and insulin and glucose resistance. I should expect my blood pressure to go up. I should expect anxiousness, anxiety, insomnia. I should expect my hormones aren't going to, my sex hormones aren't going to regulate appropriately. My cortisol, my catecholamines are up. My DHEA production is down. That's an adaptive response. In time, that adaptive response, that allic response will cause allostatic overload and disease and dysfunction. But initially it's an adaptive response. I love what you just said. Everything you said, I was like, yes, absolutely, 100% yes. And and it reminds me so powerfully that Ayurveda, the system of medicine that I teach, Ayurveda always said it, everything starts in the gut. Your immune system's in the gut. Your brain health is in your gut. Everything is in the gut. You have to address gut as the central system that impacts all systems. And so like you just said, multi, did you say multi-adaptive? Multi-system adaptive disorder. I, I, I had to do, people want to know, like, what's wrong with me? Like, what's my diagnosis? I'm like, eh. there's a lot of things creating stress load. So we, and uh, so I just came up with that term, like you have a multi-system adaptive disorder. What does that mean? I'm like, right. you got lots of stress, your body's trying to adapt to it. It's affecting all the tissues. Oh, Okay. And so now they have something to hang their shingle on. I know what I have, right? Versus I don't know what's going on. So, you know. I like that because, you know, it is a more mature approach than saying root cause. Because, and I've heard you say this on other podcasts, a lot of us who go to functional medicine are walking in saying, what's wrong with me? No one else has figured it out. You must be able mm -hmm. to figure it out. And what we're all honestly asking for is clear one answer. And I've been going to functional medicine for my kid is 13. So about 10, to, 10 plus years now. First, it started with, wow, your armor thyroid idea really worked for me. You guys must know something. And then in the pandemic, I thought, you know what, it, it's probably a good time to understand all the issues and address them. And that's when I understood, oh, this is leaky gut. So let's address leaky gut. And it kind of sent me down that rabbit hole of, of understanding, okay, the gut is so multi-system adaptive. It's like connected into everything. We have to address our health at so many levels. 
we can't simplify it. And like you said, bring it down to like the tiniest derivatives. It's really a, a more global viewpoint mm -hmm. of what am I doing for my health? Because I choose to build vibrant health. Mm -hmm. And that's how I think of it now. Because if I think of it all as homework and things I have to do, it's very unmotivating versus I just think of it as, look, if you want the whole system to work beautifully, then all the major inputs need to be addressed. Air quality, water quality, food quality, level of toxic burden that we're actively building every day with microplastics and endocrine disruptors. And so when you're looking at people saying, okay, it's the gut and it's these other systems, what are some of your approaches with them? Do you go through and do stool tests and dig in? And if it's gut dysbiosis, is it full gut healing protocols? And then what have you seen in terms of like miraculous results? I love hearing the patient stories of the shifts that can happen if we actually drive, uh, if we drill down into what that multi-system root cause issue is in that person. So the first question I think you said was like, what do we do to help from a gutty perspective? Um, number one, I want to, I want to know what are the stressors in this person's life emotionally, dietarily, like what do they eat? How do they eat? What's their calories? What's their macros? What's their relationship like? Uh, you know, what's their habits? What's their behaviors? Um, and then when we, when I look at lab, I don't just start I'm just going to do a test on your gut. I mean, these aren't inexpensive tests, but I always typically start with a comprehensive blood chemistry panel. And if I see that somebody's blood chemistry panel has multiple markers of malabsorption or micronutrient deficiencies, whether they have signs and symptoms of gut related issues or not, I'm probably going to look at their GI tract. Um, sure. I just looked at somebody's labs last night, it was my last client of the night, and uh, she's taking 12 or 13 different supplements, um, which is way too much in my my book. But, you know, if you, somebody wants to do that and they feel good and they can afford it, fantastic. But they said, look, and they didn't have much in the way of symptoms. Their thyroid physiology is not working right, but, um, and and they need 13 supplements to kind of manage their state. But they're like, I don't really have a gut issue because I take this. I don't have a, a um, I take this for that, this for this, this for that. And the labs in general look pretty good because they're managing their values with their individual supplementation strategies. But when we take a dip, deeper look, this is a person that says, I have no GI complaints. They're taking methylfolate, but they have a, their lab patterns show that they don't have enough folate in the supporting the, the, the cellular system. Homocysteine levels are elevated there. So they're taking B9 and B12 to help, right? But they have elevated homocysteine. So how good a job is it doing? They're taking glycine and they're taking other antioxidants, but they still have elevated homocysteine. Their CRP is elevated. Their fibrinogen is elevated, even though they're taking systemic enzymes to lower fibrinogen. Their lipids are elevated, even though they're taking support for their thyroid. So even though they're doing these things, we have to review labs and interpret them and say, okay, you're taking 13 supplements, but you still have, still have multiple micronutrient deficiencies, even for the things you're taking on top of trying to eat a healthy diet. There must be, even though you don't have symptoms that you relate to a gut related problem, there's likely no way that you don't have a gut related digestive issue if you're taking all these supplements and still have deficiencies. True. Makes total sense. And I see that too. I see so many people, some people, cause, cause I own a supplement company, people be like, check out what I'm taking. And then I'm horrified because I'm like, that's insane. Like we are not meant to take 30 a day. If you're taking 30 supplements a day, you should look at what you're eating and you should look at your gut health because like you said, there are people who are optimizers. There's practitioners who are optimizers. I think when you fall into this world of biohacking and building great health, you get into what are all the ways I can do this. But what I like to say is, look, Ayurveda is an ancient system of medicine that said, where, where's the land of moderation? Where do we need to be managing our lifestyle and our diet to achieve the goal and be moderate in terms of how many of these tools that we reach into? So when it comes to that patient and you're seeing that, look, they're taking 10 things for their 10 deficiencies, but they're still not winning because they're not supporting themselves at a cellular level. Are you finding that that's insanely prevalent right now because of the food quality? Because one theory I have is 
okay, I, I can eat amazingly. I eat fresh food. I source organic. I'm trying to buy even more local. We eat very little, at least I in my house eat very little processed foods. My kids don't really listen to me, but I'm, I'm eating the best diet in this house. Still, there's deficiencies. So how do we win? It feels a very chicken and egg. Yeah, I think we have to be really careful, especially in the, in the integrative and functional medicine community to make, to not make things look so bleak that, um, yeah. like <laughs> toxins and organisms and mold. And we make it sound like yeah. there's no hope, <laughs> like, um, and so sometimes we have to talk patients back off the ledge. Like, look, your body's got an amazing ability to heal, respond, recover, adapt, to be resilient if you're in a homeostatic state. But if you're not in a homeostatic state, then your resiliency goes down pretty significantly. But when we think about diet, nutrition, lifestyle, it's near impossible in today's world to be to live a perfect dietary life, and so I don't expect my patients to do it. Um, I, my goal for clients is eighty percent of the time eat healthy, whole food, locally raised if you can get it. No, you know, limited pesticides, organic if you can do it, and twenty percent of the time have some fun and enjoy yourself. Your body's got an amazing ability to heal and repair, especially the GI tract if it's in a homeostatic state then you could damage the intestinal lining. It'll repair in 24, 48, 72 hours, right? So it's not as this terrible thing. The problem is most people are not in a homeostatic state. And we're worried, I think sometimes, especially we create so much food fear that we're like, oh, these foods have toxins in them. Like the carnivore community, you've got some of those people that like plants have toxins, therefore all plants are bad. Well, wait a second. The lectin. Right. Yeah. So why those things that would be like saying exercise is bad. You shouldn't exercise because exercise breaks muscle tissue down and that's the, therefore it's not good for you. And those people would argue like exercise is good because if you stress the muscle tissue, you get inflammation and it, and it stimulates stem cells and you get a bigger, stronger muscle. Well, that's what that's what foods do. Foods do have some t toxins to them. They do stimulate an immune system to make it more resilient, right? So the next time there's a threat on the system, organism dysbiosis, the immune system's like, okay, I know what to do here, and it can start to adapt. So we need some of those things. Now, sure, should we be eating those plants when in their most toxic state when they're not ripe, they're not ready for consumption? Probably not. But when do we typically uh, pick a lot of the stuff when it's not quite ripe, when it's probably in its more, more toxic state? And that's the challenge with trying to mass feed people with mass farms. So I want people to not be afraid to eat things. I want people to not be on a restrictive diet. Restrictive diets are tools initially to make some change in the gut biome and to just to change what's going on. But you can't live in a restricted, limited diet and think that you're going to be good. You see this, I see this. People go, oh, I'm just going to eliminate gluten. Okay, I did better. But they don't realize that maybe there's some permeability issues going on there. Maybe there's some reduced digestion and dysbiosis. So within a very short period of time, they've re re eliminated the gluten, but replaced it with a whole bunch of rice. And now they're eating a whole bunch of rice and rice proteins that they can't break down and digest. Those rice proteins are crossing the barrier. Now we're reacting, the immune system is reacting to rice proteins or peptides, and now they're rice sensitive. So now I got to give up rice. I'm just going to eat this. And so they, now they replace those things with more things that they already don't have the digestive enzyme capacity to do. They have permeability, and then they go, man, I can't eat that either. So then they go get some food sensitivity testing done way too early. They have permeability, and now they're like, oh, my gosh, I'm reactive to 95 of the 100 things on here. And you're like, I can't. I can only eat, like, water and chicken and, and one other food. And right. that's, that is not a great place to be for the person's health, for their mindset. So I think what we need to do is we want to try and get them as much nutritionally dense foods as possible, as wide a variety of healthy in-season foods as possible, and then not 
create this fear that if I eat this, oh my gosh, it's going to destroy me. Obviously, if somebody has a real significant, somebody got celiac, we don't want them eating a bunch of gluten. But sure. we also don't want people living in fear. So I think that's one of the big challenges is we just got to talk people out like, hey, our goal is to make some changes with dietary changes, calm the system down, and then restore a whole food-based diet as wide a variety as we can. And that's going to be the best place for them to be long-term. All this nutrition wars thing where we circle the wagons in the functional and integrative space and shoot in is like asinine. We should be focused on the processed Franken food community, but we don't do it. I mean, it's like, they're like, I think they look at us and like, what a bunch of crazy people. Like we're, we're the bad guys, right? But they're so, we're so busy with our own dogma and our own food religion that we're arguing plants are bad. No meats bad. Like, come on. Like, meanwhile, you know, the guy eating the ho-hos and the yo-yos and drinking three different, you know, sodas is like, oh, that's awesome. Look at those stupid, you know, we need to just get back to basics and agree that, listen, you and I may not agree about thyroid physiology. You may not agree what's, I want to, you want to be a vegan. I'm a car, like, I like carnivore, like that, but that doesn't mean that this, that one is better than the other. If I take you who's a vegetarian and shift you to carnivore, it's going to change your immune system. It's going to change your gut flora, but that doesn't mean that's where you should live. And if I'm not doing good and I'm on a carnivore diet, which I'm not, but if I'm, if I was, um, if that was my strict thing and I wasn't doing good, then changing your diet is going to be helpful. It's probably going to change your gut and your physiology and your bacteria. And it can be a tool to change, but a lifestyle should be whole food. I think, you know, when you look at things like the Mediterranean style, fresh food, wide variety, little exactly. is, is, I think, has shown study after study to be a good model to follow. It's true. And people always ask me, like, what is the Ayurvedic diet? What do you eat? And I always say the Mediterranean diet is actually the best example. It has meat. It has such an honoring of fresh food, plants, variety. Um, everything is in there. Great fiber, great healthy fats, uh, a consciousness around milk and eggs and how we're sourcing things. So I definitely look at the Mediterranean diet as great. I laughed so many times when you were speaking just now because I was like, you are right. We are in these nutrition wars. It is a dogma. It is a religion. Like I consume so much content online and I'm always like, really guys, really? We're going to get that strong headed about like this diet is the only diet and we're all going to publish all the science behind our opinion, which, and it, which has become our agendas, forgetting that we're so individual. Like, we're all different. You cannot feed me a red meat diet. I am a Hindu vegetarian. Like, I will never eat beef in this life, no matter what I need for my health. Now, am I open for the first time to an omnivore diet? I actually am. Because I think when you look, like you said, at your, your labs and at the results over a period of time, if something is not working, you might really need to consider a different approach. Mm -hmm. And like you said, you might need to consider it for a time period, a set time period, not an obsessive multi-decade period, but a time period to get the result you need. And then you walk it back and you come back to variety and whole diet. And I think as a society, we're forgetting that completely because I have many people who find me and they're like, you're the tumor girl, right? You're the Ayurveda girl. Um, here's my daughter. She is so upset because she can only eat ice, water, or air, and she can't have anything else. What can you do for her? And I always say, Ayurveda teaches us, love the gut, heal the gut, and then step forward, and we should be able to eat everything. We should not really have to limit, like you said, unless you're celiac and it's something specific, we should all be able to eat gluten. And, and it's interesting, I just went to Italy for a few weeks, and I ate all the gluten and all the food to my heart's content. And it was life affirming because here in the States, I cannot eat gluten. It doesn't sit well. I don't digest it. It causes pain versus abroad. I can. And so it's just that powerful reminder of, of source the food well, but bring in diversity, nutrient variety, and, and bring in the whole picture. And so I just really appreciate how well you said that. Well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it's just one of those things where, where we forget it because we get so pigeonholed. Now, I have two more questions for you. Sure. One is armor thyroid versus synthroid. Because when 
every one of my friends and family and people I know go to endocrinology. I sat down with it. A lot of times I go to the doctor's. It's just funny, but everyone either takes me to their doctor's appointment or they want me to go see their doctor as a patient and understand the mindset. So I met an endocrinologist in uh, Boynton Beach, actually. He's retired, but he was willing to prescribe, prescribe Armour Thyroid to this group of women who I know. And so I talked to him and he said, look, I prescribed Synthroid and, and Levothyroxine and all these thyroid medications for years and decades. But what I noticed was we're prescribing the medication. We're winning at the blood labs. The numbers look great. But the patient is unhappy. The patient still has all her symptoms. So he's like, that's why if, if the patient wants the alternative, I do prescribe an armor or an NP thyroid because she needs support. But what she also wants is symptomatic support. And then I have the conversation with her of diet and lifestyle. So what are your thoughts on that? Because I keep trying to tell people you have more options than what you're seeing, but they're not seeing that. Well, if somebody is not looking to address a to me, if somebody came in and said, "Listen, I just want to have some improved symptoms," and I don't, and they and they're not converting T4 to T3 well, and they said, "I and I took, I didn't do good on T4, and I do better on Armor," and they're just trying to manage their 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 symptomatology with the medication. Fantastic, great. If if you're not going to try and identify the root cause and or the what's really going on, then you're probably going to need some T4 and T3. The problem becomes. And you what? And you should. And you, I know you probably know this. Once you start taking T3, T3 is going to sa start saturating the pituitary. And once you saturate the pituitary, now you're going to drop TSH. And once you drop TSH, if you're not on a, if you're not on a full day's production from the gland, like fully overloading or replacing what a gland would make, as you take the armor T4, T3, and you saturate. But you got to you put T4 in the system and T3 in the system, the greater likelihood that TSH is going to go down. That TSH is going down is going to suppress TSH or it's going to suppress the thyroid gland function. It's going to turn off the sodium iodine pumps or turn it down. And now you're going to start to see less production. So if your gland was making some thyroid hormone, you just reduced its ability to do more and you just shut down its ability to drive more iodine into the system to make it. So if the goal is to manage labs and manage symptoms and you have a thyroid condition, you're probably going to need some T4 and T3 because you're not converting well in the first place and you're going to need some of that T3 because T4 only is not going to do it. But keep in mind, you're going to probably need stronger and stronger doses over time. The ratio of T4 to T3 in those glandular products is 4 to 1 T4 to T3, I believe. And the body doesn't, we don't typically make thyroid T4 to T3 in our body at the thyroid gland in a 4 to 1 ratio. We're closer to 10 to 1. Some people say as high as 20 to 1 T4 to T3. So the thyroid gland only makes 5 to 10 micrograms of T4. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, of T3. So if you're trying to replace what the gland was doing, then you should only need five to 10 micrograms and maybe an extra microgram or two from an absorption standpoint, if it's 90% absorbable. But if you're not converting T4 to T3 and you want to optimize your blood levels because of decreased peripheral T4 to T3 conversion, you're going to probably need much higher levels of T4 and T3 to try and do that. And you're going to probably over time start to see a resistance to how somebody feels on T3 medication. So I'm not opposed. Anybody, if somebody says, listen, I want to take T3 only, I don't care. If you feel good and that's what you want to do, that's fine. But when people come to me and they say, um, I want to have better, I want this medications that I'm taking to work and I want to see if my thyroid gland can recover, then I don't want them on T3 if they don't need to be. I want to see them on T4. I want to watch the lab values improve on T4 only because then I know that peripheral conversion, which is where 20 to 25 of the 30 micrograms is generated is in the peripheral conversion. I want to see that improve. I don't want to mask it with T3. I want to see the appropriate conversion. So yeah, that's a tool for me as I'm um, and I'm not, it's not like, okay, you're on 30 micrograms of T3 today. We're taking you off it tomorrow. We typically have to dose it down, dose up the T4. I don't prescribe. So I have to work with their providers and I give them recommendations. But 
to me, if you're trying to fix the issue, then yeah. I wouldn't want somebody on T4 and T3 unless they didn't have a thyroid gland. If they are trying to get to the root issues, I want them on as little T4 as possible. I'm not afraid of a TSH being at four or five or six or higher. Um, because to me, once that TSH pops, and I see an increased T4 to T3 conversion, I know I'm on the right track. I know, and then depending on how high that is, I know, hey, this is a body person. We now need to check their iodine level because that TSH is staying elevated because it's going, hey, now now I need to pull more iodine into the system and we got to make sure they that it's there. But yeah. I... I, I, and I hear your argument too, like, hey, but why don't we just want to give them th some thyroid hormones so that they feel better? And I'll give you a couple of reasons right. for that if you want it. Well, wait, wait a sec. What I understand from you now, and, and this is why I loved being on your podcast and then us having the discussion after. Sometimes the discussions after the podcast are the best discussions. And that's why I was so excited to have you on my podcast. I think what you're saying is you have a thyroid gland. You would like for it to do its job itself. Mm -hmm. The problem with taking any medication is you're taking away the hard work. That's like me saying, hey, I want a fit body and great like leg, lower body strength, but you go do the leg workout so I don't have to do mm -hmm. it. So you're literally robbing the thyroid of the opportunity of functioning well mm -hmm. because you're not willing to go look at what the problem is. What's interesting is in May, and I mentioned this to you, I went to my functional medicine doctor and I said, listen, I'm going instead of my normal 100 miles an hour or 200 miles an hour, I'm having like a 250 mile an hour season in my business. I'm speaking on the biggest stages. I'm traveling all over the place and I'm trying to wrap up the whole company so I can leave the country for a bit. This is insane. I think I want more medicine. And she said, you know, as a, a patient and a practitioner, that's not the right way to go. Mm -hmm. I hear you that you just want support because you want to keep doing what you're doing. But let me remind you kindly, we always have to do the work. You always have to do the work. You have to love your gut. You have to eat well. You have to build in self-care. You have to build in recovery. You know that no car can go 250 miles an hour around the track without the pit stops. Mm -hmm. And I always say, give it to me anyway. And then it takes me a week before I'm like, that's a very stupid answer. You know you can't. You're going to crash the car. So you you have to build in the recovery. So what I hear you saying is, don't keep amping it up and not understand that one day there will be a price. Instead, take a minute, just a minute, and come to someone like you and really dig into what are those patterns and issues, understand them, address them, allow the thyroid to kick in and heal and do its job, and then forever you don't have to be medicated because your body's doing what it needs to do. Yeah, I, I, I think the challenge is, is that we assume that the body is broken and there's no intelligence. And if you I think from what, from your background and your, your belief is likely that the body is highly intelligent yeah. and the best pharmacy in the world is in here. We make all this stuff, right. right? Sometimes we just have to get out of the way and let our body do what it is. But it's, it's interesting, like even in function, in a functional medicine approach, like if I ask somebody, you know, we this T4 to T3 thing, I, we need to give them T3. Okay. Is it broken or adaptive? I don't know, but we're going to give it anyway. Okay. If you had a fever, should we be giving you something to make you feel good or should we let the fever go? We should let the fever go. Why? Because you want the body to do its job. The body is doing something specifically. To but I don't itself. feel let good, but I don't feel good. Shouldn't you make me feel better? I withhold Tylenol as far and as long as I can in this house on everyone until we're almost delirious. Right. And then I'm like, okay, fine. But, right. So, but you get my, my point, right? Yeah. We're, here we're saying you got to let the body work. And then we look at the blood work and we say, but we need to give T3, right? Or we need to, we need to optimize things. Well, that's assuming that the body is not already in an optimal state for what's going on with the physiology. But if I said to that person, hey, let's give you a bunch of aspirin or Tylenol and suppress the fever, you'd be like, well, why would you get in the way? The body, the fever, the inflammatory, those, those, that's the normal response. Of course, you're going to feel tired, fatigued, run down, not good when you're sick, right? But 
isn't all those signs and same, same signs and symptoms you feel when you have that virus and that fever going on? Aren't those the same things we see in our chronic hypothyroid patients? It's the same symptoms because when we have the fever to fight the acute infection, there's down regulation of the mitochondria, there's reduced glucose transport, there's anxiousness, there's depression, there's sleep issues, fatigue. This is just an extent, what we're dealing with is an extended illness. It's not acute anymore. We're all aware of the acute phase. And, and from a functional medicine standpoint, we'd be like, let the body do what it is. But once it gets to some like, oh, but my thyroid's down, I need to fix it. Like we change our perception. I'm not sure if we're changing the perception because we can, we're generating revenue from that, or are we, we just, we're, there's a disconnect in what we're thinking. We're thinking part of the adaptive response is okay, but these other things aren't normal adaptive responses. So it's this, we, we, we become disconnected in our thinking and our, in our physiology, in our thought process sometimes in functional medicine, where we're, we're doing both things. We're saying, this is really good to do, Right. The result of it, I don't like, so mm, I got to do something about it. So it's really, I think, uh, I think this is what creates a lot of confusion in functional medicine. Sure. And I also think that we make the same assumption sometimes that Western medicine makes, which is the patient's not going to do the work. It's a big assumption, but it, it is the work of functional medicine to compel us, the patient, and I'm in functional medicine. So for me to also compel people to do the work, because without the work, unfortunately, we're not going to win at this chronic response that the body is creating. Mm -hmm. So it's that. And you've used the term before I saw online greenwashing, mm -hmm. like we can't throw 50 supplements at the problem because those also are like throwing drugs at the problem. If we're not going to have the conversation around the like nuts and bolts that are foundational that we have to address. Yeah. I, I mean, and listen, I, I, I utilize supplementation, but if you need 50 supplements per day to manage and optimize your condition, plus hormone, re bioidentical hormone replacement, and I need hor thyroid replacement, plus all these supplements, you're not, you're not doing healthcare. You're not doing functional medicine approach. You're doing allopathic medicine with different drugs and, and, med and supplements. And I don't know that that's better. If you want to do that, go take a prescription that's going to make a change like that, right? Yeah. I, you know, it's, it, it may have a more potent effect and you, and you don't have to take as much stuff. But that's not, our job isn't allopathic medicine. Our job is we're different jobs. And here's, and I think that's the big problem. We, and me too. And I used to bash allopathic medicine. Like, why don't these silly people see it? Cause I came from an allopathic model. Right. And I was bashing allopathic medicine. And, and now I'm like, wait a minute, these aren't, this is what's been taught. This is what the things were done. Uh, this is how people learned. Um, and their job's different from mine. Their job is sure. to, pr to keep somebody alive and managed and if there's a crisis, we're going to deal with it. But they're not healthcare specialists. They're disease management specialists. Our job in functional medicine is to identify root issues and try and address those, reduce them, eliminate them to support the recovery from allostasis to homeostasis and try and maintain that. Allopathic medicine's job is to, to identify the allostatic and allostatic overload and manage those two things, which they do better with drugs. So if you want to manage the disease and you want to manage the, the adaptation, sure, blood pressure medication, thyroid medication, bioidentical hormones. But if you're really trying to do functional medicine and wellness care and health care and homeostatic care, that, this, that's what we should be doing. And we're not, we have to guard the gate. You and me, we have to guard the gate because too many people are coming into functional and integrative medicine with an allopathic pathic mindset and they're changing what functional medicine is to the general populace. They think, oh, I just, if I don't need a statin, I just need berberine. I need red rice. Yeast. Like I, these are the things I need. And that's, that's still allopathic medicine. Functional medicine would say, wait a minute, if you have elevated lipids, 
then we need to figure out why you don't have enough T3 to drag that into your adrenal gland. Why don't you have enough T3 to get it out of the bloodstream? Why are you not able to use the glucose and convert it into ATP instead of diverting it out of the cell as cholesterol? Like our job isn't to give a different form of a statin. Our job is to understand the mechanisms and physiology that actually restore cholesterol physiology. Sure. No, absolutely. I mean, we're, we're definitely on the same page and I, I've loved um, getting to know you because you're, you're obviously equally passionate about like, how do we approach building health from the ground up? How do we support people to understand there's a different approach to our health? I know I'm excited to read your book because thyroid to me is like this enigma. It's been this thing where I've, I, I focus so much on gut circadian, the things I'm more interested in, but thyroid is one of those things that's plaguing so many women. And I just want us to get the right support so we can get our op, not our levels optimum, but get ourselves optimized to where we need to be as individuals. So I know I've taken up so much of your time today. Will you share any last thoughts and where everyone can find you? Yeah, I would say the last thought is I think too many people are trying to fix the thyroid and the thyroid is the canary. It's not it is it it's the sign there's problems going on in the physiology. It oftentimes is not the thing that needs to get fixed. I just had a podcast with Joel Corey and we talked uh, about the a recent paper that that's been written and then he wrote another uh, or uh, another add on to that, but it's now thought that 60 to 90% of the pop thyroid population is put on thyroid medication inappropriately, 60 to 90%. And thyroid prescriptions are the number one prescribed medication in the United States year after year after year. And there's a downside to this. So I want to make sure that taking too much thyroid medication when it's not needed suppresses the gland and you're going to make, worsen your gland dysfunction. It wow. is going to ramp up in a, a the brain and the sympathetic nervous system if you take too much. Too much is going to reduce the conversion of T4 to T3 by deactivating the tissues. And most importantly, and the thing that really concerns me is that too much T4 in the system can increase the risk of people developing abnormal cell development, something we call cancer, okay? So we shouldn't willy-nilly be putting just people on thyroid medication so they can feel and function better. We should be more aware of what's going on first. I think you and I talked about this before. There's more and more papers confirming what my hypothesis has been is that hypothyroidism is a protective response. And there's papers that show that hypothyroidism is protective response against many types of cancer. The body down regulates mm -hmm. thyroid hormones so you don't replicate sick cells. So oh, I wow. want people to not be necessarily, again, in fear of, of, oh my gosh, maybe I shouldn't be taking thyroid medication. You may need it, but if you don't feel and function well on thyroid medication, more is probably not the answer. Like I just need to keep increasing the dose. The issue is you probably have a cell stress response going on. Your body's adaptively decreasing the conversion of T4, T3 in the cells, which is why you have hypothyroid signs and symptoms, even though your TSH may look good. And in time, that can then translate to more down regulation of the thyroid gland and the development of glandular thyroid issues. So you might need some, but you can't just take that and assume you're going to get well. So that's like the final point. And then if somebody's got wants to know more about me and what I do, I have a book out. It's called The Thyroid Debacle. I wrote with my friend, Dr. Kelly Halderman, uh, who is a, a she's a recovering uh, a medical physician. So she was a medical physician and has come towards the more functional side of things. Um, I have a website, rejuvagencenter.com. I have a podcast called Thyroid Answers Podcast, which you've been on. We had a great conversation. And um, and then I'm on social media. So, you know, usually, I guess I'm, Instagram is where I, my team probably posts most of my stuff. Sure. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I, I rarely get to meet people who I get to have such healthy conversations and really like who actually shift what I think. 
Um, so thank you. It's been awesome. Well, thank I you. appreciate being on the podcast and, and having a chance to have another conversation with you. Um, I wish you the best as you on your busy season. And I'm sure, uh, sometime in the future, uh, I'd love to, if you want to do it, we'll do another podcast swap and, and have another conversation about the same or different topics. Sure. No, for sure. I think you have so much knowledge and it's so fun to meet a practitioner who, who approaches things from a different standpoint. That's actually why I love functional medicine is each practitioner is so different and each of us is so different. Mm -hmm. And so it's our job to find that practitioner who aligns with our way of thinking and our way of being. And that's why I've loved having and finding guests like you because each person who listens to this podcast might find their most ideal practitioner. And that's what I've seen is people have gone to the practitioners on this podcast and then they report back to me and say, it's been the most profound change in their life. So thank you for joining me on the Fusionary Health Podcast today. Thank you to our listeners. Everyone who listened to this episode, please like, please share it. Please send it to someone who needs it. I know that there's so many women suffering with their thyroid conditions. And it's our job to learn more so that we can make the biggest impact on our own health. So thank you everyone for joining today. Thanks for joining me for this episode. Check out our sponsor, Fusionary Formulas, the potent turmeric supplement used by doctors around the U.S. for patients with pain and inflammation. www.fusionaryformulas.com. I'm your host, Dr. Shivani Gupta. For more, visit shivanigupta.com. Subscribe to this podcast in Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Click the follow button or subscribe in any of the apps that you use. That's all I've got for you on the Fusionary Health Podcast this week. You have the power to transform your health and achieve vibrant health starting today.